بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم این ویلکم ٹو نیوز رومام یو ہوسٹ روما خال بٹ ڈے از ٹوینٹی نائنتھ آف مارچ ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی فور اینڈ دیز آر دا اسٹوریز دیٹ وی ول بی ہائی لائٹنگ ڈورنگ دا کورس آف دا شو ویل بگن ود دا یو ایس اسٹیٹ ڈپارٹمنٹ لیٹ از شور دا گلوبل کمیونٹی آف دا یونائٹیڈ اسٹیٹس آن گوئنگ کمٹمنٹ ٹو پروینٹ افغانستان فرام سروگ ایز اے بیس فرام ٹیرزم ہی سیٹ این آئی کوٹ وی ریمین کمیٹیڈ ٹو انشورنگ دیٹ افغانستان کین نیور اگین بی اے لانچنگ پیڈ فار ٹیرزم ہی آلسو سیٹ دیٹ وی کنٹینیو ٹو ارج طالبان ٹو اپ ہولڈ آل دیئر کاؤنٹر ٹیرزم آبلیگیشنس ٹو دی انٹرنیشنل کمیونٹی ودر دے ڈو دیٹ اور ناٹ از اندر تھنگ آل ٹوگیدر سینگ دا اماؤنٹ آف انسٹیبلٹی دیٹ دے ہیو بین فارمنٹنگ ان سائڈ آف پاکستان تھرو سچ ایکٹیویٹیز فرام دا ملیٹنٹ آؤٹ فٹس دیٹ آر گیننگ گراؤنڈ in Afghanistan thanks to the support that is being given to them by the Afghan interim government. This and more is going to be discussed in our first segment. Our second story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns India and democracy. Now, Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, has said time and again that uh, India is the mother of democracy. In fact, uh, the reality of the fact is that the uh, facts say otherwise, that India is no longer either the democracy or the pluralistic country that it uh, uh, says it is. In fact, there are different things that are happening with the Indian elections that are looming uh, high, the about to happen in a couple of weeks' time. We are seeing a lot of things that are happening as far as uh, the continued hold of BJP on this political campaign is concerned, whether it be stopping the funding of the opposition parties and closing their bank accounts, suspending their bank accounts, whether it be uh, you know, incarcerating all those who are trying to say anything or trying to portray the truth of what is happening in India, whether it be also not giving a living playing field to the opposition parties in India and much, much more. Uh, with that also then uh, adds up with what is happening in the illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and the Indian soldiers who continue to commit suicide because of the depression that uh, they face uh, as they are under pressure to uh, continue their violence against the hapless Kashmiris. The, and of course, uh, uh, all the evidence that has now come to the fore as far as India's involvement in uh, the nefarious activities in Pakistan is concerned. All this will be part of our second story. Then we are going to talk about two years of talks that have failed to reach global agreement on handling future pandemics. Now, uh, we all know about what happened due to COVID-19 and how the whole world uh, was completely changed because of this pandemic. Now, the fact is that the different countries are trying to get together to form some kind of a regulation on how to deal with further pandemics, but no proper uh, um, agreement has come about as far as all of these organizations or these countries uh, is concerned. Let's hope some kind of agreement comes in the future. Let's begin with our first story, and that concerns Afghanistan, uh, the United States of America, and Pakistan. Of course, the, why do I add Pakistan? Because of the instability that is happening in Pakistan because of the involvement of militant outfits from across the border from Afghanistan. We've been joined by Zahir Shah Shirazi in the studio. He's a senior analyst and a journalist. Thank you very much, Zahir Sahib. Thank you, you have joined us. Zahir Sahib, I begin with what <coughs> Matthew Miller said. And he uh, showed the global community while answering the question uh, in the media brief that the US is committed to preventing Afghanistan from serving as a base from terrorism. But doesn't the reality say otherwise? Well, I think uh, Miller's statement is uh, apparently uh, like a lip service. Uh, if the Americans would have been committed uh, under the Doha agreement, they would have uh, compelled the Afghan government, Kabul, to stop. As per the, that agreement, they had agreed that they would not be allowing anyone to use their soil against any state. But we have seen most of uh, the attacks which had been carried out inside Pakistan uh, both the bordering provinces of Balochistan and uh, Khyber Pukhtunkhwa, some part of the former FATA, mm. they, uh, 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 the roots of those, the planning went to those uh, areas which are inside Afghanistan. So this is one thing. The second thing is now, what is the commitment? If uh, Kabul is committed to... Because uh, of what he said, uh, yeah. Miller, that we are committed yes, that, that Afghanistan can never be uh, used as a launching pad for terrorism. But actually, I, if the US would have been uh, committed, it would not have left Afghanistan again in a similar mm. situation. Mm. More than 9 to 10 billion rupees of those uh, unattended weapons, they are lying there. Uh, the militants are using those modern gadgets, guns, and uh, you know the latest mm. uh, uh, military equipment against the Pakistani uh, security forces and even the civilians. You have seen what happened in Turbat. You have seen what happened in uh, North Waziristan. And mm. I think they are so organized that they even film the, the attacks properly like a you know, fiction movie. Mm. So how that can happen? This is one factor. The other thing is 
despite this huge fencing, we uh, would not say that the militants don't have any sympathetic uh, uh, support here on the Pakistani side of the border. But actually, the planning, the execution, the weapons, they are coming across the border. Mm. And now, there are two different theories. Perhaps mm. uh, uh, the Kabul government is not willing to take action against uh, uh, their half-brothers because they feel most of these uh, militant groups like uh, 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 the ISS, the Al-Qaeda, or even the ETIM, BLA, they had been supporting and fighting uh, uh, those invading forces alongside the Afghan Taliban. So this is one reason. The second thing is, perhaps I would, what I feel, the Kabul government don't have a writ, don't have a, uh, uh, an access to those areas, and they don't have the capacity to mm. carry out uh, uh, such kind of targeted attacks against those hideouts of the militants, which are very much on the neck of Pakistani border, and they can easily cross over and carry out attacks and then uh, move back. So uh, uh, the safe heavens, perhaps they should have been targeted. All right. Now you talk of rate, you talk of capacity. You know, uh, I again go back to what Matthew Miller was saying. He said we continue to urge the Taliban to uphold their counter-terrorism obligations to the international community. And also that it is their responsibility to ensure that they give no safe havens to the terrorists, whether it be Al-Qaeda, ISISK or other terrorist organizations. Uh, well, I mean, it is apparent that Afghanistan is not paying heed to the uh, U.S. concerns. What mechanisms, in your point of view, need to be put into place in, in order to deal with such a threat? Well, you know, first point, whether the Miller's statement, we are discussing it in the context of Pakistan? Hmm. I don't think so. Perhaps hmm. Miller is more concerned about the 5 plus 1 and the Central Asian countries. Yeah, and, uh, because this yes, is what he uh, mentioned. Because, he mentioned yes, this, this is very important. Hmm. So I think they had been feeling that after the uh, Taliban's installation in Kabul, the attacks on Pakistani side increased. Hmm. The Pakistani government did... Uh, you, you know, some kind of uh, 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 confidence building measures. They even agreed to talk to those people. They wanted to, them to reintegrate into the Pakistani society mm -hmm. if they lay down mm -hmm. their arms. Mm -hmm. But they were not willing. Now, what is Kabul doing? Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps if they wanted uh, uh, to have good relations with Pakistan, this is very simple. Now, mm -hmm. Pakistan had conveyed time again, and uh, we have seen the Defense Minister, Khaja Asif, mm -hmm. as well as the Prime Minister, they have uh, very categorically uh, uh, cleared to Kabul that they have to take action against uh, those people who are mm -hmm. destabilizing Pakistan. And another thing, the nexus which is operational there, I think this is a huge network of militants supported by the, the, the Indian RAW from those hostile forces which wanted Pakistan to be destabilized and their target we have seen like in Turbat, the attack was on the, uh, the Chinese interest. Again, we have seen in Kohistan, uh, the Chinese engineers were targeted. So what is the reason to target specifically those areas which can bring uh, you know, prosperity to Pakistan and this Our BI, relations, yes. China, Pakistan economic corridor and so much. This, this is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. So this is a game changer what we, we had been feeling. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, the American pressure is there again the, uh, uh, as far as the, uh, the Pakistan's decision on Gawadar. If, if they are handing it over to uh, uh, operational activities with the Chinese government, they would again be, you know, such kind of uh, uh, attacks would be coming. What I believe, I think the international community as well as the US should uh, realize that Pakistan had paid uh, you know, uh, a huge price uh, for their war on terror for the last four or five decades. We are being destabilized. Mm. Our economy is destroyed. Mm. Uh, we have uh, sacrificed more than 60 to 70,000 people and the security forces. So mm. this is a, you know, a, a sacrifice which is far more than any of uh, uh, the coalition troops who are fighting. And then the abrupt withdrawal of the U.S. troops, I think it is again left mm. Afghanistan into a very troubled situation. The, the warlords, the, the militant groups, even the ISS and DICE, it is threatening Kabul. So this is, this is now a situation where uh, this, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the scourge of this global terrorism will again be strengthening and it will destabilize not only Pakistan but the Central Asian states and that is the reason perhaps uh, the US State Department came out mm. with a uh, statement that uh, uh, the 5 plus 1 group, they are willing to, you know, uh, control the law and order situation. They mm. wanted to go against the terrorism. But uh, I think what Pakistan would be feeling, the, the Mayyads you were saying, uh, it should be communicated very clearly to the international community as well as Kabul that enough is enough. Mm. Uh, they had done a lot of damage to the Pakistani society. Now they have to, you know, uh, properly tackle this issue or again, Pakistan would have to cross over and uh, we would see another strike against those mm. militants' hideouts, uh, which the Kabul government could not take care of. 
but the fact is that this is something that the, it has not been able to take care of. Now, Pakistan has also, as per our foreign office spokesperson, Mutaz Zahra Baloch, said time and again that Pakistan is ready to have joint counterterrorism operations with Afghanistan. And Pakistan is ready to help Afghanistan in order to get rid of these outfits. But Afghanistan has not relented or has responded in kind as far as this is concerned. This also said, uh, the, how, do you, how do you feel Pakistan now under the current circumstances when there is tangible evidence of Afghan involvement or militant outfits? Set operate from Afghanistan, their involvement is concerned. What should be the strategy as far as Pakistan's counterterrorism operation is concerned? Whether it should have counterterrorism operations with the US, because Vidant Patel, who is the US deputy spokesperson earlier in the month, while addressing while when the you know the first attacks had come from Afghanistan around the 18th, he had said that uh, pa uh, the US were in regular communication with Pakistan leaders to uh, discuss Afghanistan in detail, including our counterterrorism dialogue and bilateral consultations. Should the US and Pakistan have a joint counter Tourism operations should Pakistan also undergo these joint counterterrorism operations with other friendly countries such as maybe China, such as maybe the Central Asian countries or Russia? Well, I think the threat is to all of them. Chinese are concerned because they have conveyed directly to the Kabul government that they have to take care of more than like 800 plus the Uyghur militants, the mm. ETIM, mm. because they have restructured, they have uh, you know uh, remodeled their, their their organization. Now again, uh, uh, the, the structure they have installed, they, they they have even announced to carry out more attacks on the Chinese interests. The Central Asian republics are more worried about the ISS and Daesh because mm. they are penetrating there. Uh, so they, they, they have their concern. I think uh, the strategy which these countries should adopt, I think Pakistan should not be again uh, made scapegoat for such you know uh, 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 faulty decisions of the US and the coalition troops. They left, they have left more than like uh, billions of dollars of uh, those weapons. They are in the hands of those rogue elements, the militants, the ISS, the TTP, the TTP splinter groups, even the I ETIM. So these are serious threat to all of these countries. Mm. Now the strategy, I think if Kabul are these Taliban who had been fighting against the invading forces with the support of Pakistan from the Pakistani border, so isn't it possible that they should support the Pakistani security forces? They must exchange, uh, you know, the intelligence-based uh, information with the Pakistani authorities. And if they are committed and they are, uh, you know, uh, willing to stop those militants against mm. Pakistan, mm. it's mm. very easy. Mm. And importantly, uh, we have seen that Ra is very much active. Of course. Kabul and uh, Delhi have, uh, 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 you know, an understanding that they would be allowing soon like visa free facilities to mm. the students and the medical uh, uh, the people who are seeking medical assistance inside Afghanistan. There are reports perhaps they are trying to you know uh, my sources are saying that they, they have established a kind of a aeronautical school mm. uh, in, in far off areas in Afghanistan, central Afghanistan where they would be uh, training the uh, ragtag air force people and perhaps they are trying to uh, you know uh, again strengthen the, the, the air force. Use Afghanistan as a, Use Afghanistan as a base. So mm. now Pakistan it's a very serious challenge for Pakistan. Mm. And I think if the international community is not willing to support Pakistan, mm. I think this will be a disastrous thing. Mm. Yes, they are trying uh, to counter China. They mm. are trying to pressure Pakistan for different reasons. Uh, obviously, whenever there is, uh, there is a planning for economic revival, you see such attacks are increasing. Of course. And especially now, the people who are willing to invest, the people who are here working on different dams, like the Chinese, uh, they are in Dasu Dam, they are yeah, working on the Gomalzam Dam. And you know, a, a bad uh, incident uh, after this Khoistan attack, mm. the T51 project was stopped in Tarvela. Mm. And the Chinese engineers were asked to, you know, uh, 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 they, they, they should go back and uh, have to wait for the next order. So I think this is a planned strategy to uh, terrify those uh, uh, um, countries, terrify those uh, 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 friends of Pakistan who are willing to invest who are willing to develop Pakistan. So I think Pakistan has every right to go against uh, uh, those elements full-fledged mm. because if the US and the coalition troops can come or mil uh, thousands of miles away and uh, target Al-Qaeda, the ISS and uh, all those elements from which they are feeling threatened, mm. Pakistan is right on the border with Afghanistan and I think mm. if somebody is threatening uh, Pakistan's security, mm. uh, uh, they have the right to, to respond. 
But Zahir Sahib, how should we go full out? How should Pakistan go full out? You know, uh, the, our Prime Minister says uh, that he invites neighboring countries to come and sit together to devise a plan against terrorism. Defense Minister Khaja Asif says that Afghanistan is not making any progress to root out terrorism and calls for further tightening of border controls to mitigate this threat. And he also says there needs to be a fundamental change as far as the border situation is concerned. What kind of change are we talking about that is needed to pressurize Kabul to change its stance as far as cross-border cross militancy is concerned? Well, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the main issue is like uh, trade activities. If you can uh, stop trade activities, you, you, you close down the border, mm. it creates problems. And they're using it, Iran. It, it kind of anger, which, yes, with Iran even. Mm. I think Iran... Pakistan and Afghanistan, they mm -hmm. are the key players. Mm -hmm. If they are seriously, if they are not taking this issue seriously and, uh, you know, they are playing up, it mm -hmm. would be, uh, you know, disastrous for both. Mm -hmm. Pakistan, Iran, even Afghanistan would be destabilized. I don't think so. The Kabul government do have a writ in those no-go areas, especially in Paktika, Paktia, Khost, mm -hmm. and even in the Kunad area where uh, uh, the TTP, uh, 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 you know, the, the ISS, uh, even the Hafiz Gul Bahadur group, mm. which once was a, uh, you know, good Taliban for mm. Pakistan, now it is a bad Taliban. <laughs> but I think there is no difference between good or bad. Mm. Uh, we have to, you know, root out terrorism once for all. And uh, if Kabul is not cooperating, uh, I think this is disastrous. This would prove disastrous for them even. Mm. Uh, and this time, uh, I think they don't have uh, uh, the choice. Oh, we no. cannot change our neighbors, but we have to uh, go into a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Dialogue is one thing. We have to convince them that this threat is, uh, you know, potentially increasing for everyone. So they should realize it. Mm -hmm. The TTP, the Hafiz Gulbadar group, the Masood Taliban, or uh, the Swat Taliban, even the ETIM, the BLA, the BNA, these are all those forces which are openly destabilizing Pakistan. And mm -hmm. if any country which is not willing to take action, it means uh, they are hand in glove with them. Mm. So this is very serious because why a country which had helped them out to regain the, uh, the, the lost land, uh, according to the Taliban uh, ideology, they, mm. they were fighting the invading forces with the support of Pakistan, mm. the invading forces are flushed out, but why they are doing it? Mm. So this is a very serious question. Mm. A lot of serious questions are here, and a lot of serious questions that need serious answers from the Afghan interim government. Pakistan has been reiterating and trying to have that, you know, consultancy, those talks. We've had a delegation that went for uh, commerce talks, trade talks uh, very recently, but we need very serious talks on this front as well, and we need seriousness from the Afghan side as well, and what their actual intention is so that we can move forward as far as that is concerned, because Pakistan, as we very well know, has helped uh, Afghanistan in the last decades, the amount of refugees that are still in present in uh, Pakistan, despite the fact that a lot have now gone back to Afghanistan. There is a huge chunk that still remains in Pakistan. Pakistan has been there for them. Pakistan has tried to highlight as much the plight of the Afghans uh, is possible as it is. So, uh, what we need is a genuine concern from the Afghan side as far as the Pakistani issues are concerned and talk and come to a solution, whether it be joint, whether it be involving other countries or in whichever way or if uh, if cannot handle it, then Pakistan, let Pakistan handle it. Uh, I'm really sorry we're a bit short of time. Zahir Shah sir, thank you very much to have joined us. Uh, let's come to our second story, ladies and gentlemen, and our second story uh, concerns. India and of course as far as India is concerned from approximately a year now the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been consistently extolling India, uh, uh, portraying India as a mother of democracy across various world platforms whether it be the G20, whether it be all the other platforms and he says uh, that India is a pluralistic country. That is also something that he said at a recent summit. However, behind all of these proclamations lies a very dark reality, reality in fact, not a dark reality but the reality of what is actually happening in, in India. With uh, the elections that are just a couple of weeks away, a lot of issues are uh, have come to the fore and a lot of media is highlighting that, whether it be the way the opposition is being uh, curbed, is being stopped from uh, performing their, uh, you know, uh, duties or functions uh, as uh, any political parties do or whether it be stopping their funding, whether it be uh, the way they are targeting journalists and other uh, NGOs who are even trying to highlight the reality of India is something that uh, now uh, people across the world are com coming to terms with. We've been joined by Abid Latif Sindhu, he's a defense and security analyst. Uh, he's joining us online. Abid Saab, thank you very much to have joined us. Abid Saab, this uh, whole uh, issue of uh, uh, India being the mother uh, of all democracy and India being a pluralistic uh, country. Uh, 
when we look at the, the realities which are giving us an exactly different tale altogether. Uh, why then call India a democracy or even a pluralistic country? Thank you for uh, calling me. Actually, uh, you have very rightly said that India is no more a democracy uh, as far as the uh, definition of, you know, theoretic definition of political science is, is concerned. It is a uh, rather a autocracy in, uh, you know, uh, in a in a uh, shroud of a demo democratic uh, uh, dispensation that too only in terms of the elections and all. Uh, you have very rightly pointed out that uh, very systematically uh, Indian uh, Sangh Parivar, which is part of, which is a collusion of uh, BJP, RSS, Bajrang Dal, Shiv Sena. So it's a complete political system of socio-economic control of the Indian society and uh, even uh, which is uh, responsible and which, which is aim is to even demean the constitution of India in a way that the the internal polity of the inter, or the internal assimilation of the groups which are opposed to uh, this Sangh Parivar or which are non-Hindus are so marginalized that uh, their status in the society, in the political arena, it almost become insignificant. And uh, rightly mentioned, uh, as uh, they are, you know, moving toward their, their approach to subjug for the subjugation is wholesome. They are uh, going towards the NGOs uh, through uh, their uh, Foreign Contribution Act. They are margin de marginalizing the Muslims, the Adivasis, the scheduled caste, the journalist. You know, you name the segment of the society which is a non-Hindu or which can be a political or a social threat to them. They are trying to subjugate it and marginalize, marginalize it to a level that uh, their political entity is no more uh, uh, you know, uh, even a stall or, or even a, even a, in a smallest contest, contest of a uh, threat to the the Sangh Parivar. So their agenda is actually the complete Hinduvata and complete conversion of Indian state into a Hindu state. That is so true. Now, Abid Sahib, you know, uh, speaking of the political turmoil that is, you know, quite apparent as far as uh, India is concerned, just weeks before the elections, we see Arvind Kejriwal, the Hiri chief minister, who is arrested. We see uh, Jharkhand state chief minister, Hemant Soren, who is arrested in February. We see the entire top leadership of the AAP uh, political party, that is the opposition party, in jail. We see uh, other ch state chief ministers uh, and family members of uh, the, the hierarchy of India's opposition also in jails. Can India deliberately shun opposition through such tactics? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is, uh, you know, they are actually, uh, they, are, they have, I think, determined that uh, they have to perpetuate the rule of Sangh Parivar in India. And for that, whatever the nukes, corners or the five states, you have already mentioned that almost in five states, they are, they are feeling that uh, it is likely that they'll, the contest, political contest will be tough. So in those states, they are trying to, uh, in, you know, uh, through their uh, different enactments, through their uh, enforcement department, through criminal department, through CBI, through whatever means they can employ, they are trying to uh, remove the opposition and uh, the political leadership of those states, as you have mentioned, the arrest of Kajrawal and also uh, the arrest of two other chief ministers of Indian states. So this, they are, they are deliberately doing it uh, because uh, they cannot see anyone else uh, you know, controlling or they cannot see that the, 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 the momentum which Sangh Parivar has made or the momentum, the political momentum and the religious, religio-political momentum in which they have converted even a simple uh, Indian into a, a nation, nationalist and a fascist. They, they cannot uh, let it go in a way that some other political dispensation comes and the people get normalized. So they want to keep people in a sort of psychotic and neurotic state in which the hyper-nationalism is perpetrated through 
the Hindu Hindu nationalism. Mm -hmm. All right, I'd like to understand, Abid Saab. You know, you were talking of uh, politicians that this is what we were discussing, but you know, it is not just relegated to politicians. I'd like to talk about uh, Harsh Mandar, who is a former bureaucrat and the head of an uh, organization, and he has been openly criticizing uh, Narendra Modi and the BJP since he assumed power in 2014. Now, uh, they uh, the CBI has also raided his residence uh, and uh, have uh, you know. Uh, are alleging financial irregularities under the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act on uh, Mr. Mandir. He is just one in a series of so many people who are being subjugated so, to such uh, tactics in order to uh, mum their voice. But will, in your point of view, India succeed? I don't think so, because as you have mentioned, uh, uh, the Center of Equity Studies, which he was heading, that was a think tank which... Uh, used to actually uh, give uh, political uh, opinions on different uh, developments in the internal polity of uh, uh, political landscape of India. And uh, although they were not, uh, you know, very directly criticizing the BJP, but yet their some of the opinions were very neutral. Even uh, they could not tolerate the neutral opinion of that think tank and they subjugated it. In, a, in the same way, whatever voice, even we have just uh, seen that uh, uh, a very uh, famous writer which has written so many books he was she was once she was having a, a her book fair in delhi he was attacked so anybody who is going to give a different opinion or a neutral opinion or not doing the line of uh, extremism in the extremism will be subjected and uh, will be subjected to torture and this extreme dispensation from the state. Abhi Sahib, also, you know, uh, uh, not only that, journalists, but also those who try to highlight what is happening to the minorities in India, what is happening to the Muslims, whether it be in Ill Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, or all across India. They are all being subjugated to some kind of incarceration or some kind of tactics by the Indian government. Uh, either under draconian terror laws or under other laws. Do you feel that the BJP government has succeeded in silencing all these, all those people who have been trying to highlight the reality of, the, uh, of what they are subjugating on uh, the Muslims in India and in the Indian held Kashmir? Yeah, unfortunately, I would say yes. At, uh, to some extent, uh, they are able to uh, silence these voices and especially the voice of the minority and particularly the Muslims. You know, we have just seen that uh, uh, citizen in Citizen Amendment Act, they have excluded the Muslims altogether, giving even the right of Indian citizenship to the Sikhs and Hindus who are there in the neighboring states. And again, uh, through using the uh, National Registry of Citizens, they are again excluded the Muslims uh, from uh, that assimilation part of uh, the Indian society. So Muslims are being subjugated on every sphere of the life. As you have already mentioned, in Kashmir there is a uh, there is a problem that even the Muslims, particularly after uh, the uh, the uh, abrogation of Article 370 and 30, the imp implementation of 35A. The even Muslims are not getting the jobs. Those who are already there in jobs, they are being removed. Or if they cannot remove a Muslim, they are not sending their the, the pays in their accounts. So, you know, there's a very systematic uh, uh, sort of a, uh, I would say, uh, there is a mechanization of deliberately uh, damaging the Muslims and even uh, uh, bringing them to a, uh, to a state where they are even will be the worst than the scheduled castes. All right. Abid Saab, thank you very much to have joined us. That was Abid Latif Sindhu, Defense and Security Analyst, joining us and discussing India's different tactics just weeks away uh, from uh, the elections that are going to happen in the month of April. Thank you very much, Sindhu Saab, to have joined us. We've also been joined by Sundas Malik. She's a Kashmiri leader. She joins us right here in the studio. Sundas, thank you very much to have joined us. Sundas, we've discussed a little bit with Abid Latif Sindhu. And uh, what I'd like to extend on it is how the judiciary is also complicit in all of this. A sitting High Court judge abandons his allegiance 
to the independence of the judiciary and resigns to join the ruling party. In March of last year, a group of opposition parties petitioned the Supreme Court of India stating a clear pattern of using investigative agencies to target, deliberate and crush the entire political opposition. The Supreme Court refuses to rule on the petition. How do you see that? that do you feel that all the main organizations, whether it be judiciary, whether it be uh, the forces, are now uh, colluding with the BJP government? Well, thanks for having me and apologies for the uh, for being late. Uh, but as far as your question is concerned, I see um, in the current situation, I see all uh, pillars of state, uh, all pillars of democracy, whether that be the judiciary, whether that be the uh, journalistic uh, freedom side, whether that be the law enforcement, uh, or whether that be the freedom of religion. Uh, all these institutions who were meant to take care of these interests have uh, unfortunately succumbed to the extremist propaganda and agenda of RSS-led BJP. Hmm. So unfortunately, uh, this allegiance, uh, uh, what I find funny is that one man declared his allegiance hmm. wholeheartedly and openly hmm. uh, to the ruling party. But unfortunately, what we see through uh, history, uh, the hmm. recent history, the past decade, uh, as far as the rulings of the Supreme Court are concerned, we have seen how pro-BJP and pro-RSS and pro-Hindutva they are, mm. whether they be concerning the Kashmir issue, uh, whether they be concerning cases such as of Bilkis Banu, mm. we have seen clear-cut biasness by institu institutions as important as the judiciary itself mm. Mm. Uh, succumbing to the uh, wishes of the Hindutva uh, Popularistic mm. uh, sort of uh, propaganda. All right. So that's what's happening. All right. Yes. So in this, I'm going to have a very quick yes. round of questions and answers yes. where we can uh, gather the maximum information as, yes. as possible. Journalists who are critical of the government are facing routine investigation or arrest, and the Indian media is on the other hand also being used to thrash the opposition in one way or the other, and uh, the you know uh, propagate the corporate interest of the BJP. How low will India stoop? Well, I've heard uh, some uh, talks of uh, them now introducing laws as far as the social media is concerned as mm. well to restrict any uh, dissent as far as the BJP can, government is concerned. So as far as, like I said, uh, and Rahul Gandhi also mentioned uh, in one of his interviews that the democracy side of India is now dead. There mm. is no freedom of spe speech. There is no freedom of expression. Uh, uh, as far as Kashmir is concerned, we see a vehement rejection of this Naya Kashmir. However, mm. we don't see uh, free journalistic pieces on what the Kashmiri people are dealing with. Mm. We don't see uh, 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 issues such as the Manipur issue, such as the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act issue. We don't see them being highlighted. We don't see India's uh, um, um, constant failures as far as the uh, regional uh, position is concerned, as far as their diplomacy is concerned, whereas America is concerned or as, as them thrashing Germany Mm. or you know take uh, taking a bullistic sort of approach towards other nation we see that and we see that this is a propagandist regime which is being run by an autocracy uh, in 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 the guise of this uh, you know uh, extremist uh, mm. democracy so uh, it is a failure of all sorts at all ends as far as india is concerned let's talk finance also yes. the bank accounts of the main opposition parties are frozen this is yes. what uh, the congress has said it says and i quote our entire financial identity has been erased uh, we have no money to campaign, we cannot support our candidates, our ability to fight elections has been damaged. At the same time, we see different bonds that are coming out yes. uh, and the, the BJP government take making full use of it yes. for its financial support and for its financial gains. Uh, uh, can this be countered in some way or the other by the opposition or this is going to go unabated? Well, I, I would make a suggestion they make an immediate donation to the BJP electoral fund uh, and probably their investigations under the ED or the CBI would, mm. uh, you know, stop or maybe they would get bathed easily mm. because that's what we see as a pattern as far as industrialists are concerned, as far as these big giants of industries are concerned. Mm. We see them donating huge, huge numbers uh, to the BJP when they 
come under such investigations mm. uh, and uh, you know their bank accounts are frozen but maybe you know they can gather up some money to send to the BJP electoral fund all right last uh, two questions I want a single or two phrase answer yes. hundreds of Indian soldiers have committed suicide in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir because of the desperation they face because of the atrocities they are forced to commit on the Kashmiris what does that show can any uh, change come within the forces <coughs> in India well, uh, there's either, either going to be, uh, we are seeing uh, the, uh, you know, uh, spurts of mutiny within mm. the Indian army itself, or we, we are seeing uh, the, the resistance within the Kashmir, uh, uh, you know, making it such the condition that it is not easy to govern this. So there are two messages that the Indian forces are given, uh, giving. Number one, they're failing in Kashmir. Number two, they're failing in Kashmir. All right. All right. Just one I think the different attacks in Pakistan has also India's stamp on it. When, when now that we have the proofs, now that we see the way India is operating as well, what should the responsibility be of international organizations to stop India from perpetrating such heinous designs against Pakistan? One well, phrase answer. The, the, the international community has created a Frankenstein monster. Uh, as far as the Indian uh, government or the Indian uh, position is concerned mm. in the regional uh, aspect, uh, as far as the regional aspects are. So I think they need to uh, put down this monster immediately. They need to take strict actions against India, uh, sanctions or, uh, you know, clear messaging from the US and, uh, you know, such powers needs to go to India. All right. Thank you very much on this, Malik, to have joined us, to have come to the studios. Let's come to our very last story very quickly. This thing is that two years of talks aimed at striking a landmark global agreement on how to handle future pandemics such as COVID or other future pandemics that could come have failed to seal a deal in time. This is going, this whole uh, talk is going to start again next Thursday for one pile final push. The people agree on the principles of what should be done when the next pandemic strikes, but the nation are still at odds on how far they are prepared to go to deal with such pandemics. And this is how, then they, this is where they need to work together and to come to a solution before it is too late, before another COVID strikes, before another pandemic strikes the world, and we are again crippled economically or otherwise. There are a lot of points of dispute, whether it be shared access to emerging pathogens, uh, the balance between richer and poorer, nations and information sharing on how new and emerging pathogens are coming and how that information needs to be dealt and shared with between the developing and the developed countries as well. I hope a proper resolution comes in due time. With that, we come to an end for today's newsroom. We'll see you inshallah on Monday. It's the weekend. So have a wonderful weekend and have uh, the good fast. It's the last days of Ramzan. So let's hope things go fine with all of us. But do remember the people of Palestine, of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir in your prayers. Allah Hafiz.